SoFi or PayPal, which is your favorite fintech? And I hear some of you saying, hang on, Felix, one is an exciting startup and a charismatic leader, and the other is a dead as a dodo dinosaur. But wait for it. They are actually very, very similar. If you don't believe me, look at this chart here. In turquoise, you've got SoFi, SoFi's trademark turquoise. And in white, PayPal's trademark white, you've got PayPal stock. You can't actually trademark a color, I don't think. At least I didn't think so. Anyway, they are moving pretty closely together since the very moment that SoFi got listed. Why is that? It's fintech. And the market kind of looks at fintech fairly similarly. And the market's been hating fintech ever since. I'm not quite sure when, but it happened all not that long ago, sometime after COVID. Everybody got very excited about fintech and thought it was going to be the new thing. And then everybody started to hate it. So I'm going to walk you through here the sort of investment banker comparison of the new upstart and the old dinosaur on life support. Not really on life support, but you get the idea. Before we do, I want to encourage you to do one thing for yourself. Come and join me live on Tuesday and learn how to make money from your money in three steps, three or four hours a week, following a formula, a system, a structure, rules. None of that. Should I buy this? Should I sell that? None of that. Just rules. If you want to learn it for free, I give it away. Felix friends at org slash webinar. Grab yourself a seat. If you don't want to, your year will probably be the same as last year. I wouldn't want that for you now, but here we go. Okay, let's just do a quick, quick glance at the last quarter's revenue. Uh, earnings, you know, profits, all that sort of good stuff. And SoFi comes in with, I literally have a white pen. Brilliant, isn't it? Technology, just when you want it. Here we go. 600 million revenue in the quarter. Well, PayPal comes in at 8 billion. So PayPal is the older gentleman in the room. PayPal brings in a 1.4 billion profit with a 17% margin, whereas SoFi brings in a 48 million profit. Yay! This is my new party emoji, but only an 8% net margin profit. Why is that? Why is SoFi not more profitable, you wonder? Well, look at how much money they're spending, for example, on G and A, sort of good old boring stuff, back office stuff, 21% of revenue. Whereas if you go over to PayPal, that is only 7% of revenue. Why is that? Well, you only need so much nonsense in the back end. And if you grow, that nonsense gets divided by more income dollars, revenue dollars, so it becomes irrelevant. So as Anthony Noto said, we've spent six, seven years building up all of our tech stack, becoming a bank, spending money on the whole system. We've now done that. Now it's time to cha-ching, make some money. So their overheads should not be rising all that much because it's all technology and Handling five bank accounts versus 5,000 bank accounts is pretty much the same thing from a computer's point of view. So, okay, you get an idea, but you can see the businesses are similar. It's just you would expect SoFi's profit funnel to sort of widen and, and then hopefully actually exceed PayPal's. Uh, why would it exceed? Because they run a lot leaner than PayPal. What about just general financial health? And SoFi is always the left chart here. PayPal is the right chart in case you were confused understandable to be confused. It happens to all of us. So far here on the left, growth health is glorious, cash flowing, yeah, private profit health. They've only just become profitable, so you can kind of ignore that. And the stock is sort of done all right with a C, not amazing. What about good old PayPal cash flow? Brilliant. It's actually very profitable, even though people complain about the margins all day long. And growth is so-so but it's not expensive, which is actually kind of a good thing. Whereas SoFi doesn't have a relative value. You know why? Because computers find it difficult to deal with something that's only just become profitable. Seems to break most systems, so, so there we are. What about the core metrics? So I look at a couple of core metrics and I'll explain them to you so you know what I'm talking about. And one is, my favorite, is gross profit margin. It's basically the amount you sell it for minus your cost of sales. 
And for SoFi, that is the cost of acquiring a customer plus what they have to pay out to get that customer. That could be advertising, that could be some sort of affiliate fee. You know, you see lots of irritating YouTubers going, sign up for a free account here and you'll get X shares there, you know, that kind of thing. Um, that's a cost of acquisition. So that comes out of the revenue initially and forms your gross profit margin. 81% is pretty good. It's pretty staggeringly, gloriously, wonderfully exciting. And it means it's a very good business and it's quite hard to replicate it. And it's quite unlikely that customers sort of jump ship very quickly. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to make such a margin. Revenue, two billion, all right. Uh, profits, yeah, they're not quite there yet. They've only just turned green. Return on capital is therefore negative, so we can ignore that as a growth company. But this earnings growth rate. Now, earnings is a fancy word for profit. I don't really know why people don't just call it profit, but they don't. Profit growth rate is 43%. That's wonderful. So we have two really wonderful numbers here. What happened to my mouse? Microsoft. I didn't criticize you. Why did you break my mouse? And let's look at PayPal. So this here is PayPal, in case you were forgetful about what video we were watching. I'm just saying that the average PayPal investor is a little bit older. So, you know, you want to be respectful. Gross profit margin is half of SoFi. So that's kind of a eh, eh. Revenue, however, is, is a lot. Okay, we got to give them that. It's like 15x times bigger company. And return on invested capital at about 12% is pretty great. But long-term earnings, that means profits, growth rate at 7% is pretty bad. And the way I look at companies is at a most simplistic level, I take the return on invested capital and the long-term earnings growth and I go, well, it's going to grow somewhere in that range, the share price, 8 to 12% which is all right, but 8% would be underperforming the market, 12% would be just sort of in line with the market. So it's not glorious, is it? So that's why people don't like PayPal all that much at the moment. There it is. There is actually a fundamental reason for it. What about financials? No, not the financial statements, they say. I used to be scared of financial statements and then, well, became a banker, I was kind of forced to look at numbers. And you get to love them after a little while because they actually tell you quite a lot. One thing I like to look at is free cash flow. Now, so far as a bank, free cash flow isn't like the key metric here. Um, it is improving, but it's still negative. And if you look at PayPal, on the other hand, free cash flow is like two and a half billion um, in the last quarter, 4 billion in the last year. Uh, and they're going to use a lot of that money and they expect that actually they guided that to be 5 billion plus, And they're going to use at least 5 billion of that to buy back their own shares. So that is supportive for the share price because less shares out there means we have to divide the pie by less hungry mouths. You're basically killing off hungry mouths if you look at shares that way. I know it's a very odd analogy, but my, my brain works in very odd ways. And I also like to look at, have they beaten expectations? So you just look at this here, look at the green numbers and the red numbers. And for SoFi, we've had only one this is nonsense, actually. Nobody was expecting that to be four cent higher. No, 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 they actually beat. That's nonsense. That's the thing with data. I think they've beaten consistently over the last eight quarters. And PayPal has too, actually. So they're both pretty consistent, pretty consistent with their delivery, which is a good thing. It means management isn't entirely moronic and idiotic. And then here is one thing that confuses people sometimes. You know what yield is? the yield you make from your shares. It's a fairly, I was going to say simple concept, but it isn't actually all that simple, nor is it logical. So what do you do? You divide, you take 100 and you divide it by the PE ratio, and that gives you sort of a yield, a percentage return on your present investment. It doesn't have that much to do with the share price, but it gives you a fairly good idea. Are you overpaying or are you not overpaying? So right now, SoFi is trading at 61 times profits, which of course is bananas and would therefore give you a, let's write it down here, SoFi now. 
100 over 61 is, let's ask Uncle Bill, 100 over 61 if he wasn't too busy with little girls, 1.6%. Did I just say that out loud? I shouldn't say things like that, should I? And that's now. What about SoFi in 10 years? And that is a more interesting number. In 10 years, the expected PE is 3.6x. So that is now 100 over 3, let's say. And even I can do that maths, and that's 33%. It's a banker-proof maths uh, challenge. Why does that happen? Why does the PE decline like this? Because every year, your, your share price, your P is fixed. That You pay for it today, right? Fixed. Whereas your profits grow every single year by some amount that some analyst pulled out of his backside. So that's SoFi. What about PayPal? And let's use a light blue for PayPal just to confuse you completely. And PayPal currently has a, an 11 times PE. So you do the same idea, 100 over 11, which is, what is that, 9? 9% um, 9 yield, that is PayPal now. PayPal. And PayPal in 10 years is 100 over 3. That's called 2.93, which is also 33%. So actually, the expectation is that both will be valued the same way in 10 years' time. Why? Because SoFi is going to grow more and PayPal is going to grow less. So actually, fairly similar again, which is also why these stocks are trading at similar trajectories. Now I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to give you two trades that I maybe look at, and I wrote that in here so I wouldn't forget it, you know, uh, old banker brain and all of that. And we do that by going over to a piece of software called optionswatch.io. I'll put the link above and somewhere below. And software that we build, the goal being very simple, give you the same data that Wall Street has access to. And when I was at a bank, I spent about $60,000 a year on data subscriptions. I was a cost factor for the bank. And you're not going to do that, right? Because that's kind of silly. So we built this and it's much cheaper. So you can get a free trial or you can pay $59,000 a year for it. Kidding. It's 15 bucks a month, but you can get a free, free month off as well. So this is a PayPal stock chart. And what do you see? People always make charts very complicated when it's actually really fairly simple once you kind of know where to look. Now, there are a couple of things I look at, and that is, one is, are we above or below a certain line? The certain line we shall call the 50-day moving average line. It's that yellow line there. That is the 50-day MA moving average. You're above it. It's a good thing. You're below it. It's a bad thing. Very, very, very simple. And it just means that you are going up or you're going down. Now, PayPal had this sort of cataclysmic, horrible drop after earnings. And if you look at the candles, and I will actually put out a video explaining candles because I appreciate not everybody knows what they, what they really mean. What do you see? Well, you see this great big red candle there, which is bad. And then the next day, you see that we are climbing up very, very nicely and that the green candle closes higher than the previous red candle. So that's actually quite a bullish setup. Still below this 50-day moving average line, so it's still not super, super bullish, but it's kind of like, well, sort of getting there. So what I actually did is I set up a trade when we were around about here, or maybe it was a slightly above that, I can't remember, because I thought the reaction was overblown, but that's me being a little bit more, you know, aggressive. If you wanted to be a little bit more cautious on this, then there are a couple of data points we can look at. One is that, let me just move these lines about. Yeah. One is that there is actually support. Maybe I'll use a red color here. There is support down here at $55. How do I know that? Because this little red line here tells me so. Understand how that works if you like. That's where the market's positioned. And 
Also, what I've got is, well, I've got this level here now as support. Yeah, we're at that level. And that also sort of connects to the lows that we have over here. So in that sort of $55 to $56 range down here, I've got a bit of a support zone, right? That's kind of what we're looking at. And when you then go higher, you're wondering, well, where is the, where is it, where's the resistance? Well, one will be the 50-day moving average line. That'll be resistance. And then when we get up to 65 up here, that sort of zone up there, you will also get resistance, R for resistance. And I can again see that this green line up here at 65, there's a lot of, a lot of call options up there that actually puts a lid on the party uh, of the, the stock. So you could say, right, well, let's just wait until the stock recovers to the 50-day moving average line, and maybe at that point I become bullish on it, and that's a fair thing to do. Um, another way of playing it would be, which is a little bit more aggressive, would be to position yourself. Yeah, what, what, what color have we got left? Uh, we've got blue, light blue we've got left. <laughs> so I'm going to point in a line here. This line here in blue is my break-even line on this trade. Even, if I could spell. And that is positioned at $56 and a bit. And that means we would make money if the stock went up. We would make money if the stock went sideways. Or we'd make money if the stock dropped 4.7%. And that tells me that over here, we have a 68% chance of making money and we could potentially make a 35% return. It's a little bit of an aggressive setup. I'm not a huge fan. I myself am positioned about two and a half dollars lower, but there isn't really that much money left at those price points, I think. So that's one way to look at that. So essentially what we're saying is the beauty of this is the fact that we've got this zone here, which I call our margin of safety, which means we can be wrong on the direction and still make money. Sufficiently confused or do you want me to look at SoFi? All right, I'll take that as a let's look at SoFi. Maybe then we'll figure out what the heck this guy is on about. It At the beginning, it looks a bit more complicated than it is, honestly. It's like first time you come into a new car and you try to figure out where the steering wheel is. Well, that's not so hard, but you know, the, the indicators and that kind of good stuff. It's just, it's, it's just something you need to you need to find where they are, and then you know where they are. It becomes a lot easier. So here is SoFi. So what do you see on SoFi? Let's let's run through the same sort of idea here. So you've got support at actually at eight dollars. Hang on. Yeah, and also at seven, and then at six. Those are your three levels of support. We're trading now at eight dollars sixteen. And then the resistance uh, kicks in really properly at $10 up here, which is also that recent peak up there. And I, I, I suspect there'll be a little bit here too from that high. So that's kind of your setup. So you're kind of closer to your support on the downside than you are to your resistance. And you will also note that you are presently below the little yellow line there. I should use a thinner pen, uh, which is the 50-day the moving average line, the 50-day MA. So you're below it, so it's not exactly a super bullish setup. But if you were just chronically bullish so far because you couldn't help yourself, then how would you set up a trade on this? Well, I would go probably to here. And let me delete all of the lines and show you why. Because it positions you very beautifully. This isn't financial advice, so you know. Use a simulator, use a paper trading account. But what can you see? The lows here and there and here are exactly where your break even is. So the yellow line is your break even at $7.56. And that means the stock could go up, you make money. You can go sideways, you make money, or you can drop. 7.4%, minus 7.4%, and we make money in all directions, and we're very, very happy. That's the idea with it, right? 28% potential payoff, which is a fairly significant amount. So it's a little risky, 66% chance of profit, you know, the devil and all that. I 
ideally like to push it a little bit lower. And you could do that. You could go down to here. It would just take your profits down to 12%, but 82% probability because now your break even is down here, which is actually a whopping minus 15% below the market, which is probably the much safer setup. So that's the sort of thing that we do. And that's how we make money by being wrong and still being okay. You want to learn how we actually do that. And I'll walk you through it, not in 30 seconds, but we've got like an hour to do it in. And I'll start at the beginning and finish at the end. Whereas here we sort of just throw you in the cold water and go, does it make sense? And it probably doesn't. Come and check it out, felixfriends.org slash webinar. And it's free. It's fun. You can ask me lots of questions. I do a massive monster Q&A for you. And let me know whether you enjoy the video. Let me know whether you think PayPal or SoFi is where you're going to put some money or you've got some money or you hate both of them. Or maybe you're just going to wait and see a little bit. I'd love to hear your perspective down below in the comments. I answer and read all comments. And I thank you for tuning in.